All right, thank you for uh, watching this uh, video. This is the story of Crispin, the cross of lead. Avi. You know what? I have no idea what that means. It's by A-V-I. We're going to call them Avi. And yes, my hair looks interesting. These are my pipe cleaner curls. Actually, they're not my pipe cleaner curls. They're my hairs and pipe cleaners because... You keep spitting. <laughs> I know I'm spitting. It's okay. Praise God. All right, let's get to it. Chapter 1, England, A.D. 1377. This is a quote. In the midst of life comes death. How often did our village priest preach these words? Yet I've often heard, yet I've also heard that, quote, in the midst of death comes life, end quote. If this be a riddle, so was my life. One, this is chapter one. The day after my mother died, the priest and I wrapped her body in a gray shroud and carried her to the village church. Our burden was not great. In life, she'd been a small woman with little strength. Death made her even less. Her name had been Asta. Since our cottage was at the village fringe, the priest and I bore her remains along the narrow, rutted road that led to the cemetery. A steady, hissing rain had turned the ground to clinging mud. No birds sing, no bells tolled. The sun hid behind the dark and lowering clouds. We passed villages, village fields where people were at work in the rain and mud. No one knelt. They simply stared. As they had, st as they had shunned my mother in life, so they shunned her now. As for me, I felt as I often did, ashamed. It was as if I contained an unnamed sin that made me less than nothing in their eyes. Other than the priest, my mother had no friends. She was often taunted by the villagers. Still, I had thought of her as a woman of beauty, as perhaps all children think upon their mothers. The burial took place amongst the other paupers' graves. The burial took place amongst the other paupers' graves in the walled cemetery behind our church. It was there the priest and I dug her grave in watery laden clay. There was no coffin. We laid her down with her feet toward the east. So when the day of judgment came, she would, may God grant it, rise up to face Jerusalem. As the priest chanted the Latin prayers, whose meaning I barely understood, I knelt by his side and knew that God had taken away the one person I could claim as my own, but his will be done. No sooner did we cover my mother's remains with heavy earth than John Acliffe, the steward of the manor, appeared outside the cemetery walls. Though I had not seen him, he must have been watching from a sh he, he must have been watching us from astride his horse. Asta, son, come here, he said to me. Head bowed, I drew close. Look at me, he commanded, reaching down and forcing my head up with a sharp slap of his gloved hand beneath my chin. It was always hard for me to look, look on others. To look on John Acliffe was hardest of all. His black bearded face, hard, sharp eyes, and frowning lips forever scowled at me. When he dined to look in my direction, he offered nothing but contempt. For me to pass near was to invite his scorn, his kicks, and sometimes his blows. No one ever accused John Acliffe of any kindness. In the absence of Lord Furnival, he was in charge of the manor, the, uh, the laws, and the peasants. <clears throat> To be caught in some small transgression, missing a day at work, speaking harshly of his rule, failing to attend mass, brought an unforgiving penalty. It could be a whipping, a clipping of an ear of the ear, imprisonment, or a cut-off hand. For poaching a stag, John the alemaker's son was put to death on the common gallows. 
as judge, jury, and willing executioner, Acliff had but to give the word, and the offender's life was forfeit. We all lived in fear of him. Acliff stared at me for a long while, as if in search of something. All he said, however, was, With your mother gone, you're required to deliver your ox to the manor house tomorrow. It will serve as the death tax. <laughs> they tax you for dying. <laughs> but sir, I said, for my speech was slow and ill-formed. If I do, I, I won't be able to work the fields. Then starve, he said, and rode away without a backward glance. Father Quinnell whispered into my ear, Come to church, Asta, son. Will pray. Too upset, I only shook my head. God will protect you, he said, resting his hand on my shoulder, as he now protects your mother. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Sorry, that was my, that was a narrator comment. <clears throat> his words only distressed me more. Was death my only hope? Seeking to escape my heart's cage of sorrow, I rushed off toward the forest, barely aware of the earth beneath my feet or the roof of trees above. I paid no mind into what I ran or that my sole garment, a gray wool tunic, tore on brambles and bushes. Nor did I care that my leather shoes, catching roots, roots and, or stones, kept tripping me, causing me to fall. Each time I picked myself up and rushed on, panting, crying. Deeper and deeper into the ancient woods I went, past thick bracket and stately oaks, until I tripped and fell again. This time, as God in his wisdom would have it, my head struck a stone. Stunned, I lay upon the decaying earth, fingers clutching rotting leaves, a cold rain drenching me. As daylight faded, I was entombed in the world dark, in the world, in a world darker than any night could bring. The end of chapter one. Now chapter two. Long past the hour of compline, the last prayer of the night, a sound aroused me to a confounded state, or I'm sorry, to a confused state of wakefulness. Being of the utter because of the utter darkness and the painful throbbing in my head, I knew not where I was. Though unable to see, I could smell the air and realized I wasn't at home, nor was I in the field where I often slept with the ox. Only when I sniffed again did I become sure of the woodland smells and cloying air. The rain had ceased, but it was as if night itself had begun to swear. I'm sorry, begun to sweat. Then, in a burst, I recalled my mother's death and burial, my leaving the cemetery and the priest, my plunge into the woods. I remember tripping, falling. Putting a hand to my forehead, I felt a welt and a crust of hardened blood. Though my touch made me wince, the pain banished, the, remem the remaining dizziness. The pain banished the remaining dizziness. I realized it was in the forest, and I realized I was in the forest and lost. My tunic was cold and wet. Lifting my head, I looked about. Midst the tangle of trees, I saw a flickering light. Puzzled, I came up on my knee to see better. But save that flame, all was murk and midnight mist, and silence lay as thick as death. In haste, I made the sign of the cross and murmured protective prayers. Mind, godly folk had no business beyond their lawful homes at such a time. Night was a mask for outlaws, hungry wolves, the devil, and his minions. Them who of what, I asked myself, had caused the sound that had brought me to my, to my senses, maybe? It was my curiosity, another name, my mother had often said for Satan that made me want to see, want to see 
What was there? Despite fear of discovery, I crept through the woods. When I came as near as the light as I dared, I raised my head and tensed, and, and tensed my legs, steady to flee if necessary. Two men were standing in the clearing. One was John Acliffe. In one hand, he held a fluttering torch. As always, a sword was at his side. The second man, I'd never seen before, dressed like a gentleman with a face of older years. He wore a hood attached to, the, to a flowing cape that hung down behind his legs. Gray hair reached his shoulders. His blue over tunic was long, quilted, and dark with yellow clasps that gleamed in the torchlight. Within the circle of light, I, I also saw the fine head of a horse. I assumed it was the stranger's. The two men were talking, straining to listen, forgetful of danger. I rose up from the bushes where I hid. As I looked on, the stranger, the bushes, no, well, I'm sorry. As I looked on, the stranger pushed aside his cape and brought forth a wallet. From it, he drew a parchment packet affixed with red wax seals. He handed it to a cliff. The steward unfolded it. The parchment was wide and filled with what looked like writing. Three more red seals and ribbons dangled from the bottom edge. Passing the stranger the torch, passing the stranger the torch so he could see better, Acliff took up the document and cast his eyes over it. By the bowels of Christ, I heard him explain even, even as he made the sign of the class of the cross over his chest. When will it happen? If God wills, it will come soon, the stranger said. And am I to act immediately? Acliff asked the man. Are you not her kin? The stranger said. Do you not see the consequences if you don't? A great danger to all of us. Precisely. There could be those who will see to it, see it so, and act accordingly. You'll be placed in danger too. As a frowning Acliff began to fold the document, he turned away. When he shifted, he saw me. Our eyes met. My heart all but stopped. Asta, son, Acliff cried. The stranger whirled about. There, the steward shouted, pointing right at me. Throwing the, the document aside, he snatched back the torch, drew his sword, and began to run in my direction. Transfixed by fear, I stood rooted to the spot. Not until he came close to me, did I turn and flee? But no sooner did I than I began ensnared, that I became ensnared in brambles that caught me in their in their thorny grasp. Though I struggled and pulled, it was to no avail. I was too well caught. All the while, Acliff was drawing closer, his face filled with hate. When he drew near, he lifted his sword and swung it down. In his haste, the sword's defending arch missed me, but cut the brambles so that I could rip myself away before he could take another stroke. I ran on. A cliff continued to pursue me, sword and torch up. He would have caught me if he had not, in my blind panic, tumbled over a cliff. He would have caught me if I had not, in my blind panic, tumbled over a cliff. Though of no great height, it took me by such surprise. I went hurling, hurtling through the air, crashing upon, crashing hard upon my side and rolling down a hill. I was stunned by breath, my breath gone, but I had enough sense to roll over and look back. Above me at some distance, I saw Acliff's torch and his face peering down. When I realized he had no idea where I was, I dared not move. When his light finally retreated, did I pick up myself and flee. I ran as far as strength and breath allowed, halting only when my legs gave out. When I threw myself upon the ground, grasping, then I threw myself upon the ground, grasping for breath. For the remainder of the night, 
I found little rest. Note only was I in fear of being found and made subject to the steward's wrath. I was still engulfed by grief at my mother's death. Then too, I had turned from the priest when he had asked me to, ch me to church. I had broken the curfew too. Why even I'd stolen church? Why e I'd even stolen church wine to ease my mother's pains before she died? In short, I was certain God was punishing me. Even as I waited for his next blow, I sought with earnest prayers forgiveness for my sinful life. Mom, where are my pencils? Chapter 3. That life of mine began on the feast, the feast of St. Giles, in the year of the Lord, the year of our Lord, 1363, the 36th year of the reign of Edward III, England's great warrior king. We resided in Stromford Village with its 150 souls. For as long as I can recall, my mother had simply called me son. And since her name was Asta, Asta son became my common name. In a world in which one lived by the light of a father's name and rank, that meant since I had no father, I existed in a shadow. But he like so many, had died before my birth during a recurrence of the great mortality, often called the plague. Or so my mother had informed me. She rarely mentioned him. Nor did she ever take another husband, a circumstance I did not question. It would have been a rare man who would want so frail and so impoverished a woman for a wife. For in the entire kingdom of England, there could have been no poorer Christian souls than my mother and I. I had few friends and none I completely trusted. As quote unquote Asta son, I was oft the butt of jests, jibes, and relentless hounding. In other words, he was the butt of all the jokes. Why do they taunt me so? I once asked Father Quinnell during one of my confessions. These confessions were numerous since I had become convinced there was some sin embedded in me, a sin I was desperate to root out. Be accepting was the priest's advice. Think how blessed, think how our blessed Christ was taunted on his cross. I did try to accept my life, but unlike our perfect Jesus, I was filled with caution and suspicion always expecting to be set upon or mocked. In short, I lived the life of the shunned, forever cast aside, yet looking on, curious as, the, curious as to how often others lived. There was little my mother or I could do about our plight. We were not slaves, but neither were we free. The steward, John Acliffe, never lost an opportunity to remind us of the fact that we were villains, serfs, bound to Furnival, Lord of Stromful Village. Yet this Lord Furnival had fought in France or had been off to mercenary wars for so many years that most villagers, including myself, had never set eyes on him. It did not matter. Spring, summer, fall, Save certain holy days, my mother and I, like every other Stromford villager, worked his fields from dawn to dusk. When winter came, we fed the animals. We had an ox and now and then a chicken, gathered wood and brush for heat, slept and tried to stay alive. At a time when bread cost a quarter penny, a loaf, a quarter penny a loaf that is, the value of my mother's daily labor, by King Ed Edward's royal decree, was a penny each day, mine but a farthing. Our food was barley bread, water, ale, and from time to time some cooked dried peas. If good fortune blessed us, there might be a little meat at Christmas tide. Thus, our lives never changed, but went around the rolling years beneath the starry vault of distant heaven.
Time was the great millstone, which ground us, which ground us to the dust like kerneled wheat. The Holy Church told us where we were in our alterations. I'm sorry, in our alterations of the day, the year, and in our daily toil. Birth and death alone gave distinction to our lives as we made the journey between the darkness from whence we had come to the darkness from where we were fated to await judgment day. Then God's terrible gaze would fall on us and lift us to heaven's bliss to throw us down to the everlasting flames of hell. I'm sorry, let me reread that. Then God's terrible gaze would fall on us and lift us to heaven's bliss or throw us down to the everlasting flames of hell. <laughs> this was the life we led. It was so doubt, it was no doubt, the life my, my forefathers had led, as had all men and women since the days of Adam. With all my heart, I believed that we would continue to live the same until Archangel Gabriel announced the end of time. And with my mother's death, it was as if that time had come. This is the end of chapter 3.